Last time we considered local maxima, local minima of functions of two variables and also a new phenomenon in the case of two variables called saddle points. The definition of a saddle point is kind of negative. What does that mean? If a function has a horizontal tangent at the point that is the gradient is equal to 0 and if the function does not have a local maximum or a local minimum then it has a saddle point right. So it is kind of uh, negative for a local maximum something has to happen for a local minimum something has to happen if both the things do not happen then it is a saddle point okay. But in all the three cases the gradient at that point of the function of two variables has to be 0 that is the basic thing and then now today we are going to talk about absolute maxima and absolute minima. Uh, before that I want to tell you something about the behavior of the domain as far as points nearby are concerned. So let me start with one variable. When we talk about absolute maxima, absolute minima of a function of one variable, we look at the domain to be equal to the closed interval AB, right. And we said that if a function f is continuous taking real values on this interval, then it has to have a local maximum, local minimum. It has to have absolute maximum, absolute minimum, local I do not know. Absolute maximum, absolute minimum it, it has to have. What was the result do you recall? It says that the absolute maximum and the absolute minimum is assumed at a point which is either the end point A or B or at a point where the derivative does not exist or at a point where the derivative exists and is equal to 0. Those points are called critical points. A point is called critical point if the derivative does not exist or it exists and is equal to 0, a interior point. Now in this domain, this is the domain here, what are the interior points? Look at the definition of what is interior. Interior point means around that point some small neighborhood has to be contained in the domain. So if I take a point like this, there is a small domain, a small interval about it, open interval which is contained in it. Whereas this is not the case here, the moment I take an interval about this point, no matter how small it goes out. Some part lies in, some part goes out. So these two are, we have been calling it end points, but we shall now call them boundary points. So what is a boundary point? Boundary point is a point such that whenever you take a interval about it, some part goes out, some part stays in, that is a boundary point, okay. So the concept of a boundary point depends on what a neighborhood is. In the case of real variable or a R that is just the real line, the neighborhoods are open intervals like this. Now we shift to the two variable case. This is R case. Then this is R2 case. So you have a certain domain, right. Now we want to distinguish points of the domain in two categories. One, an interior point, just like here. This was an interior point. Similarly, interior point means what? A point about which a whole neighborhood, no matter how small, some small neighborhood about that point should completely lie in the domain. So if I take a point like this here, then there is a small disk about it which is contained in it. So it is an interior point. On the other hand, if I take a point like this, no matter how small a disk I take about this it goes out. So this will be a boundary point, all right. So in other words, a point of this domain D, so here the neighborhoods are disks. Everything depends on what a neighborhood is. Here neighborhoods are intervals, here neighborhoods are disks, okay. So it means that at such a point, there is a sequence of points in the domain which converges to it because every small disk intersects the domain. But there is also a sequence of points coming to it from outside the domain, all right. So this is the definition of what is meant by the boundary. Now if it so happens that whenever a sequence 
of points in the domain converges in the plane R2, the place to which it converges is already in the domain D. Do listen to me again. Whenever a sequence of points in the domain, for example, here, this is a sequence of points, right? Whenever it converges somewhere in R2, that somewhere has to be in the domain. For example, if I take this sequence, it might converge here. Is it in the domain? Yes. I may take a point sequence like this converging here. Is it in the domain? Yes. If, huh. no, 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 but okay, I did not tell you what is D. By D, I meant the entire uh, region that I have drawn here, including what are the points on the boundary. Okay. So, being a boundary point or not is important when you apply the definition of what is meant by a closed set. So, here is the definition of a closed set, and I will explain to you by giving some examples. A subset D of R2 is called closed hmm? if and only if whenever a sequence of points in the domain converges somewhere, then that somewhere has to be in the domain itself. Example, take the closed disk about a point x0, y0. closed disk. How do you write this? All points x and y such that distance between x, y and x0, y0 is less than some number r, some radius r. Now, if I put less than or equal to, it will mean that the circle of radius r is also included. If I ex write here strictly less than r, it will mean that the circle is not included. All right. So, let us take for the moment D to be this domain. There is some similar example given that will, it is very similar. All right. So, if I take a sequence of points in this domain where this is included, this is the radius is R, no matter where I take a sequence, provided it converges somewhere, the place to which it converges is in the domain. Therefore, such a domain is called closed. You get the idea of closed? Whenever a sequence in the domain converges to some point in the whole plane, that point, it can converge to only one point, right? It cannot go to two places. So, wherever, wherever it goes somewhere, that somewhere has to be already in the domain. So, this, so therefore, this D is closed. Suppose, I will just draw the picture. Suppose I take this same disk where I include the upper half of the disk, upper half of the circle, but exclude the lower half. So, this is omitted, but I keep the upper half. Is it closed? Let us check. Whenever a sequence of points in the domain converges somewhere in the real life, somewhere in the plane, it has to be in the domain. Suppose I take the points starting from here and going down here. This is a sequence of points in my domain. This is my domain, right? This is a sequence of points, it converges here, but that place where it converges is not in the domain because I omitted some part of the boundary. You understand me? So, this set is not closed, whereas this set is closed. If I exclude the entire boundary, then also it will not be closed. The moment I exclude one point of the boundary, it will not be closed, alright? So, this is the definition of... so. Please understand this definition very well because it is going to come up again and again and again. It depends on what a neighborhood is. So, I will call it NHD, that is neighborhood. Here the neighborhood of, <coughs> we are not concerned with it at the moment, but since we are talking about it, let me tell you a similar thing in R3 also. It is not very different. In R3, what will be the situation? It depends on what the neighborhoods are. What are the neighborhoods in R3? Solid balls with some certain center, certain radius, okay. So, if I have, let us say, a cube like this, there are certain surfaces, right, which bound the cube. Just like here, this curve was bounding the domain. There are certain surfaces, top surface, bottom surface, side surfaces, four of them and so on. So, if I include all the surfaces in my domain, 
then that domain will be closed in R3. Why? Why? Because whenever a sequence of points in my cube converges somewhere in R2, it has to be in that. But the moment I omit one point of the surface from my domain, right? Then I can go to that point from my domain, but the place I go is no more in the domain. Do you understand me? Just like here, if I omit just one point here, then it will not remain closed. Similarly here. Now, what does that mean? It means the boundary here will be defined as follows. What is the boundary? A point is in the boundary of the domain. Here the domain D here is this is my domain D entire cube is okay. A point is in the boundary if there is a sequence converging to it from inside as well as a sequence converging from outside. You get me the point? So here the neighborhood is a solid ball. This is the neighborhood here. So it all goes by because convergence of sequence means what? You have to come into every neighborhood about that point, is it not? Convergence of a sequence and being inside a, no matter how small a neighborhood is, is one and the same thing. All right. So now let us go quickly. I hope the ideas are clear. This we shall come to little later. At the moment we are going to concentrate on R2. Okay. So a set is closed as a set whenever a sequence that converges somewhere has to converge in fact to a point of D. A point is called boundary point if there is a sequence converging to it from D and a sequence converging from outside D. You, you remember if D is the domain here then R2 minus D but minus is not subtraction omitting. So you write backslash like this. So this is the this is the domain D, this is the complement of D, things which are not in D. All right. So this is now these are the examples I have given you already many examples, so we shall go to it. Now we come to absolute maxima, absolute minima. That point, if a point is to be in the boundary, a sequence from inside must converge there and a sequence from outside must also converge there. Then it is called a boundary point. That is the definition of a boundary point, okay. So about ab absolute maxima and minima, what was the result here? Either, either the absolute maximum and absolute minimum is taken at a boundary point or at an interior point which is a critical point. Means what? Either the derivative does not exist or the derivative exists and is equal to 0. Exactly the same. This is the result that we shall be proving about absolute maxima and minima. But before that, we have to be sure that there will be an absolute maximum, there will be an absolute minimum. For example, if I take the function fx equal to x times y and my domain is the whole real line, is there an absolute maximum and minimum? No, because and when x and y are positively large, the function is taking very, very large values. There is no bound to it. So there is no question of maximum, right? So first we have to be sure that the function is going to have a absolute maximum and absolute minimum and it is going to be taken in that domain, right. So we had a similar result in the case of one variable. Remember in the one variable case we had two important theorems, intermediate value property or intermediate value theorem and the second one was extreme value theorem. What was the ex extreme value theorem? If you have a closed and bounded interval and the function is continuous on it, then it has to at attain its maximum and minimum on that do interval a to b. Exactly same result here. Extreme value theorem, it says if you start with a non-empty closed and bounded subset. So you need to know three things. What are the three things? There must be something in the domain. If you start with an empty domain, how can, so no matter which function, how can it attain its maximum or minimum at that point? This we did not say in case of one variable, we, because we took a less than b. So that domain a to b is always non-empty. So it has to be non-empty. Second, it has to be closed. Now you know what is meant by close. What is close again? Repeat. A sequence in that domain D, if it converges somewhere, that somewhere must be in the domain D. And the third property is bounded. Bounded, in the case of one variable, what was bounded? Bounded means there is something above alpha and something below beta. So it has to lie between alpha and beta. That was bounded. Similarly, in the case of R2, what is, what is bounded? You take a big enough circle about 0, the whole set has to be contained in that circle. 
So if I take a circle of radius alpha, every point in the domain has to have norm, that means its distance from 0 less than or equal to alpha. So that is the definition of alpha. All right. So we are not going to prove this theorem. We did not prove it in the case of one variable also. The proof is rather involved and it is slightly beyond our scope at the moment. So we are going to assume this theorem. What is the theorem? If a function, if a domain is non-empty, closed and bounded, you know all the three things. And if the function is continuous on it, then the function is bounded and it attains maximum minimum. So there is a point x1, y1 in the domain at which the minimum is taken. There is a point x2, y2 in the domain where the maximum is taken, all right. So this is known as extreme value theorem. It has exactly the same statement as in the case of one variable except that in the case of one variable, we only looked at the interval a to b. Now we are look, looking at any subset of R2 which has these three properties, non-empty, closed, bounded, all right, fine. So now we come to critical point. What is the critical point in the case of one variable? Either the derivative does not exist or it exists and is equal to 0. What is a critical, an interior point. Eh? So similarly, what is an inti, what is a critical point for the function of two variables in a domain, it has to be an interior point, then either the gradient does not exist, that means one of the partials does not exist or if the gradient exists, the gradient should be 0, very similar. So we just go by analogy what we have done one variable, just jack it up one more dimension. Instead of the derivative here, you have the gradient, is it not? Derivative is f dash x naught, gradient is f sub x x naught y naught, f sub y, x naught y naught, because there are two variables now. So we have to look at the partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y. So that is the definition of what is meant by a critical point. And the proposition and the proof, if you go back to the slide that we proved this uh, uh, similar proposition of one variable, is word by word the same proof. There is no change. But let me go through it again because it will remind you of what we did and then immediately apply it here. All right, so the proposition says if you have non-empty closed and bounded set and f is continuous, then the absolute minimum m, small m, and the absolute maximum capital M is attained either at a critical point or at a boundary. How to prove this? Go case by case. Let us look at me. You can read it later. Go case by case. Suppose you have a continuous function on such a set. I want to show, I want to prove this result that it is maximum, let us say minimum. Minimum is attained at a boundary point or at a critical point. How to prove? Suppose it is attained, I know at a boundary point, we are done. Suppose it is not attained at the boundary point. It is has to be attained somewhere. That is the extreme value theorem. If it is not attained at the boundary point, it has to be attained at the interior point. There are only two kinds of points, either boundary point or interior point. If it is attained at an interior point, again two choices. Gradient does not exist. It is a critical point. Gradient exists, then we have proved that if a function has a local minimum and the gradient exists, it has to be equal to 0. The gradient has to be 0. That was the main thing we proved while we are doing local maxima, local minima. We have already done that. End of the proof. Do you get me? Again, once more. Suppose the maximum is taken on the boundary. We are done. Suppose it is not taken on the boundary. It will be taken at an interior point. Again, two possibilities. At that interior point, gradient does not exist. Well and good. It is a critical point. Suppose the gradient exists because the absolute maximum is also a local maximum or minimum, whatever you want to call it. Then the gradient has to be 0, end of the proof. Do you get me? Simple, exactly same thing we proved in the case of one variable. So we are just doing it. Just as in the case of one variable, we had a procedure of finding absolute maximum, absolute minimum. Do you remember that? I told you several times there that when I ask you to find an absolute maximum, absolute minimum, do not worry about the points that you are going to find out, whether there is a local maximum, local minimum, inflection point, forget all about it. What are you supposed to do? Only find out the end value at the end points, remember, and value at the critical points. Make a list, like a table, and whichever is the biggest becomes the maximum, whichever is the smallest becomes the minimum. Exactly the same thing here, okay. Now, the difference is the following. In the case of one variable, the boundary points are only two. We call them end points, A and B. Here, boundary points can be many. For example, here, the whole thing is a boundary point. Here, 
this whole thing is a boundary point ok. So, just finding out the value at the end points was enough in the case of one variable, here it is not enough, here you need to say as far as the boundary is concerned what are the maxima and minima on the boundary. Now what happens in two variable case is usually the boundary of a domain consists of certain curves. For example, take, take the annulus, you know what annulus is? My domain D is the annulus, the points which lie between those two circles, outside circle, inside circle. So what is the boundary of this annulus? The boundary will be the inner circle and the outer circle, you can see it. So if I want to find out the maximum, absolute maximum of the function on an annulus, I have to see where the boundary points are. So I look at this curve, I look at this curve, find out the maximum on the boundary. How to find it? Because it is a one variable case, it is a curve, no? I will comment more about it. For example, even simpler is this one, take this one. This is my domain D. To find the absolute maximum on a rectangle like this, what I have to do? Find the maximum here. Can you find it? Sure, because we have one variable case. It is only the y which is changing, right? Here also only the y is changing. Here only the x is changing. Here also x is changing. Understand? So find out the maximum on the boundary pieces. The boundary consists of certain pieces. Here there are four pieces. One, two, three, four. So separately you have to find the maximum and minimum on those boundary places. And what else to be done? As far as the interior points are concerned, find which are the critical points. How do you find critical points? Find out points at which the gradient does not exist. That means what? One of the two partials does not exist or both the partials exist and are 0. That is it. Then make a list. In that list, whichever is the biggest is the maximum whichever is the smallest is the minimum. Is that clear? It is not different from one variable. If you have understood, now this is going to happen from next week onwards, we are going to talk about double integration. The results, ideas are exactly the same as Riemann integral. But if you have not understood Riemann integral, then I will suggest that when you look at the double integral, it will provide you as a reminder or as a revision of Riemann integral. But it is the same. Actually, I should not write those slides at all because the same results, same nothing else, definitions are the same. What is meant by double integrable? It is the same as the integrable. I will come to that next week. But what I want to say is nothing new is going to be learned in the next one or two weeks. When we start vector analysis, something very new is going to. So be ready for that onslaught. Last five, six lectures are very, very different from what we have been doing. But these lectures should be very smooth because they are the same ideas that we have already done for one variable, okay. So with that uh, explanation, let me go quickly now. So determine the critical points. They are all interior points. By definition, a critical point is an interior point. Determine the boundary points. Restrict the function to each of the one dimensional piece of the boundary. For example, this is a one dimensional piece. This is a one dimensional piece, right? It is like a curve and so on. Find out the uh, find out the extreme values or find out the absolute maxima and absolute minima on each of these pieces, okay, make a list and then find out the values of the fun function at critical points, whichever is the largest and so on. So let us, having said all this, uh, let us take an example to illustrate. So here you have x, y greater than or equal to 0, x plus y less than or equal to 9. Can you imagine what the domain is like? Yes, what is the domain? The domain is a triangular region, correct? It is in the first quadrant, x is greater than or equal to 0, y is greater than or equal to 0 and x plus y less than or equal to 9. So what will be the picture? Picture will be like this. This is x plus y equal to 9, okay? <clears throat> so this is my domain. If I ask you to find absolute maximum and absolute minimum of whatever function I have written here, 2 plus 2x plus 2y minus x squared minus y squared, what is the first thing you must worry? Is there going to be an absolute maximum? Is there going to be an absolute minimum? If I ask you to find it, there should be one. But I say find if there is absolute maximum or not. Then you have to worry about it. Maybe there is no absolute maximum. You are 
working in vain all these procedure you will follow and finally you will see that ah, there is no absolute maximum. How do you guarantee there is an absolute maximum? How do you guarantee there is absolute minimum? See if the domain is non-empty closed bounded. Is it non-empty? Yes. Here is the point. Right? Is it closed? Look at the boundary points. All the boundary points should be in the domain. Then it means it is closed. Are they? Yes. Third, is it bounded? What does bounded mean? It lies inside a begin of circle. Does it? Yes. If I take a circle of radius 3 if, or if I take a circle of radius 4, it is all right. So, it is a closed end bound. Is the function continuous f x y? Look at this function 2 plus yes, x is continuous, x squared is continuous, sum is continuous. Yes. All right. So, there has to be a maximum, there has to be a minimum, absolute maximum, right. So, we are in shape now. Now, how to find it? Find the values of the function at the critical points. The function is all the partials exist everywhere. So, there is no question of gradient not existing. The gradient exists everywhere. O o what does that mean? It means you have to find out where, where the gradient is 0. So, f sub x, what is it equal to? 2 minus 2x squared, uh, 2 minus 2x. It should be equal to 0, means it should be equal to 1. Partial with respect to y, 2 minus 2y, it should be equal to 0, means y equal to 2. So, what are the critical points? Only one critical point, 1 comma 1, okay. So, simple enough. So, the only critical point is, and then find out the value of the function at that point, it comes out to be 4, you can check it. Now, you have to find the boundary of the, now there are three boundary pieces, here, second, third. On each boundary piece, I will find out what is the absolute maximum, absolute minimum. How do I do it? By one variable case. Look here. If I take the first boundary piece or let us say x equal to 0. So, I am looking at this boundary piece. So, the function you have to put x equal to 0. So, it is a function of y only. So, this is the function of y. 2 plus 2y minus y square. You have to find out its absolute maximum, absolute minimum. How will you find? Either it will be taken at the endpoints or be taken at a critical point where the derivative of the function vanishes. That's, that's what I have done here. So, at the critical point y equal to 1, is it a critical point? Differentiate this with respect to y. Hmm? What is it? Y belongs to? Uh, oh, I see. Y does not go all the way. Thank you. So, here there is a correction. Y belongs to 0, 3. Y goes from 0 to 3. It does not go up here. Thank you. All right. So, I will I will make that correction. So, at the at the critical point y equal to 1, what is the value? The critical point is y equal to 1, x is equal to 0. So, this is a critical point. Huh? Oh, uh, 3 plus 3, ajay x equal to 0. So, the two mistakes cancelled. <laughs> this is 0, 0. This is 0, 9. So, I do not have to make any correction. Eh? It is correct what I wrote. Only the picture I drew was not correct. All right. So, y goes from 0 to 9. All right. So, at y equal to 1, so here is a point 0, 1. This is a critical point. So, we find the value at 0, 1 it is 3, then at the end points 0, 0 is the end point and 0, 9 is an end point, okay. So, define. Same thing I do for x. So, x goes from 0 to 9, critical point is here 1, 0 and the end points, find the values. Then you do the same thing here. What will you do here? The equation of this line is x plus y equal to 9. So, either you put y equal to 9 minus x or you put x equal to 9 minus y. Then it becomes a one variable case. You treat the one variable case. So, that I have done here fx at uh, f at x 9 minus x you get a when you substitute x lies between 0 and 9 critical point comes out to be 9 by 2. I will not do the calculation here. Find the value of the critical point 9 by 2, 9 by 2 x equal to 9 by 2, x is equal to y. So, 9 by 2, 9 by 2, find the value. Are we done? Yes, except for making a table. 
How many points will be in the table? The critical point of the function as a function of two variables, there is only one. Then these two endpoints, then this point, this is already there, add this one, add this one. These two are already there, there has to be add one there, that is all. So this is the, this is the table C which is bigger, so simple no, just like one variable. Which is the biggest becomes the absolute maximum, which is the smallest becomes up. So I have made it look easy. But it is not all that easy every time. Why? Because the boundary can be complicated. Here the boundary happens to be a segment like this, a segment like this, a segment like this. Therefore, we could immediately use one variable case. But often the boundary is not like that. Boundary may be like this, a ellipse let us say. What will you do? Then it is not as easy. So, you have to parameterize the ellipse with a variable t, t is the parameter. Then it becomes a one variable case. You understand? So, I am going to comment about that later, alright. So, is this clear now? Very simple. Now, yeah, this is the second point. In case the boundary piece is not a straight line like this, but something a curve and so on, then how to treat the boundary as a one variable situation? Because we want to find the maximum and minimum of the function on the boundary as well. Maybe the boundary is a circle, then how to do it? So, you flatten out the circle. How do you do that? Parameterize the circle, cos t, comma sin t, doesn't it? T goes from minus pi to plus pi, that is flattening out the circle, is it not? Then you apply your one variable result to the interval minus pi to plus pi, you get it. Now the applying the result of one variable after flattening out is not the same as applying the result without flattening out. This is what the next result says, it is an important result, it is called orthogonal gradient theorem. Let me read it out what it is, I will explain to you and the proof is again one line proof, but here is the result. Suppose you have an interior point x0, y0 of the domain and c is a parameterized curve in d. What does that mean? Here is your domain d, this is d and you have a curve here like this, this is the curve c. It comes from an interval alpha to beta. T here goes to x t comma y t. That is the parameterization of the curve, right? T equal to alpha will start here, let us say. As t goes from alpha to beta, it will go and come back here. Hmm? Right. So you have a parameterization of the curve means x y from alpha beta to d, x t naught. So suppose uh, uh, the uh, the curve passes through x naught y naught. So this is your point x naught y naught. The curve passes through x0, y0 means what? There is a point t0 here which is taken at that point x0, y0. Then the result says if the function, if the function f when restricted to c has a local minimum, extremum, that means now forget about the value of the function elsewhere. Concentrate on the values of the function c, exactly like what we wanted here. Instead of the straight line segments, if I had a circle or I had ellipse. Then what to do? That is what it is telling you. So look, suppose the function has a local uh, maximum or minimum on this one. If the function has a absolute maximum at that point, it is going to have a local ma maximum. Understand, no? So that is what we are going to use it for. So suppose it has a local extremum, maximum, minimum. Suppose these functions x and y, x and y are functions. They go, x goes to xt, y goes to yt. xt means the x coordinate. Uh, x coordinate, y t means the y coordinate and so on. Then the gradient of the function f, f is a function going from here to the real line. Then the gradient of the function f is perpendicular to the tangent vector. Yesterday we talked about tangent vectors. What is the tangent vector? Tangent vector to the curve at this point is given by x dash t naught, y dash t naught. Is it not? The curve is given by this. At a point t naught, the tangent vector is given by x dash at t naught, y dash at t This is the tangent vector, all right. So the orthogonal gradient theorem says that the gradient of the function at this point is perpendicular or orthogonal to the tangent vector to the curve at that point, the point, not all the points on the curve, at the point where the function takes a local extremum. 
all right so that is what the orthogonal gradient theorem says it doesn't say that the gradient is orthogonal at all the tangent vectors it says the gradient is orthogonal to the tangent vector at a point where the function takes a local extreme right not not at all the points what is the proof proof is very simple we have we are reducing it to one variable case look at the function phi from alpha beta to r what is the function phi go by x y go by like this so going from here to here is the function phi apply chain rule we studied chain rules no that is the reason we studied chain rules so this is a function of one variable if this is differentiable this is differentiable then the composition will be differentiable i can find out the derivative so what is the derivative of the function phi dash equal to f sub x x dash plus f sub y y dash that is the chain rule remember all right so phi dash at t naught will be equal to 0 why because it's a critical point of the function it takes absolute maximum or minimum there so by the chain rule this is equal to 0 phi has a local mag extreme moment find at t naught if the function has when restricted to c has a local extremum here this function will have a local extremum at t naught because the same values no values don't change okay so this is a one variable result phi dash t naught is equal to 0 that means this is equal to interpret this fx times x dash plus fy times y dash it is equal to 0 what is that it is the inner product or scalar product of two vectors what, what are the two vectors the first vector is f sub x at x naught y naught f sub y at x naught y naught that means the gradient at this point of the function f dot x dash t naught y dash t naught is it not fx times x dash plus fy times y dash equal to 0 we have proved orthogonal gradient theorem let let me say it in words yeah it will become nothing is nothing may come in parallel no 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 one variable case because of the parameterization it becomes in one variable you you agree that if a one variable situation if you have a local extremum the derivative is zero do you agree so i am simply finding out the derivative of phi phi is the function from the real variable to the real variable right i am trying i am just writing down the derivative by chain rule the derivative happens to be this if you are going to ask me why well ask the chain rule this is the chain rule does must the derivative be zero yes because it has a local extremum that means this right hand side is zero which means what does it mean it means the tangent vector is perpendicular to the gradient that is the interpretation of this right hand side being equal to zero that's what i wrote here understand no okay fine so let's look at an example a quick one now huh? because we have spent enough time so look at this domain d what is the domain unit disk huh? radius one center zero what is the boundary circle can we use one variable situation as we did in the case here no because we have a curve now and we don't know what to do but actually we found out what to do parameterize the curve how do you parameterize the circle cos t sin t it becomes a one variable situation find out where the gradient is perpendicular to the tangent vector that's all okay so let's do that first we have to look at the critical points of the function as a function of two variables what is the uh, what is the gradient what is the function x times y what is the gradient of this function y comma x hmm? this is a gradient y comma x when will it be zero x equal to zero or y equal to zero. or x, x uh, bo both have to be zero y must be zero x must be zero. both must be zero so at the critical point what is the value of the function zero done so first first step is over second step boundary is given by cos t sin t apply now the orthogonal gradient theorem how do you apply find out the gradient at x t y t and the tangent vector x dash y t what is it equal to delta f at x t y t is y t comma x t 
times x dash t y dash t. So, what is y t? y t is sin t times x dash t. What is x dash t? Minus sin t. So, minus sin t square. Then that is the first, uh, that is then the second one y t into y dash t. What is y t? What is y t? What is y t? y t into y dash t has to be 0, is it not? Is it not? So, y t means not y t, <laughs> gradient at x t y t. So, the gradient at x t y t is x t, x t is cos t times y dash t, y dash t equal to cos t. So, cos square t minus sin square t plus cos square t has to be equal to 0. So, that means what? Sin square must be equal to cos square. How many places it happens? Huh? sin square equal to cos square at pi by 4 both are equal to half at this point then at minus pi by 4 also they will be equal and here also they will be equal. So, 1, 2, 3, 4 points ok. At a local max, uh, extremum the gradient must be perpendicular to the tangent. We found out conditions, found out points at which the gradient is perpendicular to the tangent vector, right. That is what we did here, gradient tangent vector. Perpendicularity condition means what? Inner product equal to 0. We found out these 4 points. Find the values of the function at these 4 points. Are we done now? First we looked at the critical points of the function as a function of 2 variables. Then looked at the boundary points. Boundary point is a curve, happens to be only one curve. If it were a annulus, there will be two curves. So, you have to do like this two times, one for the inner circle, one for the outer circle, right. And on the outer circle here, there is only one circle, found out points where the gradient is perpendicular to the tangent vector, right. Those are the four points that we found. Compare the values, you get the answer, plus half, minus half, okay. Now, here is a separate situation called constraint maxima and constraint minima, we have enough time. What does that mean? Actually what we are doing is a constraint maximum, constraint minimum, is it not? We look at the boundary point and we say the values of the function as far as the boundary points are concerned, what is the absolute maximum, what is the absolute minimum, that is what we are doing, no? So we have already studied constraint maxima, so you know the idea of a constraint minimum constraint maximum. It means look at the values of the function constrained to lie on a certain subset. As far as that subset is concerned, where is the maximum taken, where is the minimum taken, alright. In this case, it happened to be this piece, then it happened to be this piece, then it happened to be this piece. In the next case, it happened to be the circle, they are part of the domain. But we do not have to worry about this being a boundary or not. I take, can take any subset of the domain and I say I want the maximum of the function, but not over the whole domain, only on this subset of the domain or some curve that is given in the domain. For example, here is the domain. Here is the function f taking real values. I say I am not interested in the maximum and minimum of the function over the whole domain, but I am only interested as far as I take a cut like this. As far as this line is concerned, what is the maximum, what is the minimum? So, the points are constrained to lie only on this subset. Understand? What we already considered is that subset happened to be the boundary but it does not have to be the boundary, it can be any subset. For example, the subset can be like this. As far as this subset is concerned, this wavy curve is concerned, what is the maximum of the function, what is the minimum, alright. This is called constraint maxima or constraint minima. You understand? I do not want the absolute value or the absolute maximum of the function on the entire domain, but only on a certain curve which passes through the domain, right. We have already considered that curve to be boundary curve, 1, 2, 3, whatever it is. Now we want to consider any curve, not necessarily boundary, okay. So, 
this will apply to the boundary curve also. So this will, whatever we are doing now, will give you an additional method of finding out what is the maximum and the minimum of the function on the boundary curve in particular, right. So this is one more method of doing it. As you know, this is called Lagrange method of, or what is it called, Lagrange multiplier method. That's what we are going to. So first let me explain what we are doing and why we are doing and then I will state a precise result. We shall not prove that precise result, but I will explain to you how to use it and so on. All right, so I already told you. So here is one more example I have given here. Instead of this, suppose the domain is a annual, annulus like this, 0, 0. Suppose this is equal to half and this is equal to 2. Okay. So the domain consists of all points which are at a distance at least half from the origin and at most 2 from the origin. That is the annulus. Suppose I take the unit circle, that is radius is 1. Is it a curve in the domain? Yes. So I want to find what is the value, what is the maximum of the function, not on the entire annular region, but only as far as the circle is concerned, okay. Is that circle a boundary circle now? No. So earlier we were talking only about the curve being a boundary curve. Now we say, okay, forget it, whether boundary curve or not, does not matter. As long as it is a curve in the domain and I want to restrict myself to only that curve. How to find the absolute maximum, absolute minimum? So what is the method? So this method I will explain to you. I would like to show that if at such a boundary curve, function takes absolute or even local, okay. If the function restricted to this curve, if it takes, takes a local extremum at this point, then the gradient of the function f calculated at that point, okay, is parallel to the gradient of the function which defines this curve. Now, what is this defining this curve? Remember when we talked about curves, we said a curve is defined implicitly by a function of two variables, g x y equal to 0. For example, g x y equal to 0 defines a curve implicitly. In this case, what will be the, what will be the function g x squared plus y squared minus 1 equal to 0. This curve implicitly defines the circle, okay. So here is the situation, f is a function defined on the whole domain, okay. G is a function which defines a curve in that domain. You understand? For example, here, this is a curve defined by the function G. So now you have two functions, F and G. What is F? The original function defined on the whole domain. What is G? Again, a function defined on the whole domain, but I am going to equate it to 0 so that I will restrict to a curve. The function g x square plus y square minus 1 is defined on the whole domain. But I want to see only those points at which g is 0, then I will be restricting to this curve, okay. So on such a curve implicitly defined, how to find the lo uh, uh, local maximum points, uh, what happens at the local maximum points, local minimum points, that is what we want to do. And we are going to show that the gradient or we are going to claim that the gradient of f at such a point is parallel to the gradient of the function g. What is g doing? g is defining the curve, it giving you the constraint. g equal to 0 is the constraint. We are not finding maximum and minimum of g, right? The roles of f and g are entirely different. f is the given function whose maximum, minimum, etc. we are discussing. G is a function which is defining a curve inside the domain and I want to find the maximum and minimum of f when I restrict to that particular curve, okay. And the result says that if the function f attains or has a local maximum at a point on the curve, then the gradient of f is parallel to the gradient of g where g defines that curve, okay. That now I will give you an idea how this, how why should this be, okay? And then I will tell you the exact uh, exact result. So <coughs> suppose this is the function which is defining the curve, right? Suppose I am able to solve y in terms of x. That is what is meant by implicitly defining, is it now? 
here how will you solve for y in terms of x what will you write here y equal to square root of 1 minus x square you have to decide plus or minus but let us take plus for the moment. So this function defines this curve implicitly this is the curve circle is it not parametric representation of the circle will be cos t sin t we just now we saw okay. So suppose that y is defined in terms of near that point x naught so here is the point where g is having a uh, local maximum or local minimum what does that mean y is defined in terms of x that means there is a function of x so y can be written as a new function of x this is the new function this is equal to eta x original function was g but g defines y as a function of x this is eta x okay so i instead of y i can put eta x g x y equal to 0 instead i have g x instead of y i will put eta x so the this equation then becomes g x eta x equal to 0 all right fine so we have g x eta x equal to 0 and eta x not equal to y not yeah because the curve passes through this what does that mean it means g x not y not is 0 but y not is equal to eta x not is it not y not is equal to eta. so eta x not equal to y not suppose the function eta x that is defined like this is differentiable then g x eta x equal to 0 so a function of x equal to 0 what will be the derivative equal to 0 if a function is identically 0 on a certain straight line x goes from a to b is it not the function is 0 the derivative is going to be 0 so find the derivative again chain rule so how chain rule is important by chain rule derivative of this derivative of g with respect to x plus derivative of g with respect to y times the derivative of y with respect to x okay so what e what equation we got gx plus gy into eta dash equal to 0 that is a consequence of the chain rule all right now let us look at the function phi equal to f at eta x eta x what does that mean I am looking at the function f restricted to that curve eta x x comma eta x is the point on the curve so look at this function phi equal to x eta x now this function has a local extremum at x naught that is what we meant the function has a local extremum here this at this point x naught y naught means the function phi has a local extremum at x naught that means its derivative has to be 0 again chain rule fx plus fy plus eta dash equal to 0 now compare these two equations they came from different arguments how this came here because g x eta x is identically 0 so differentiate you get this how this came because f has a local extremum at that point so we used our result that the derivative of the function of one variable at a local extremum is 0 so compare these two equations this then this one what is common eta dash at x naught is common instead of gy I have fy here gx I have fx right compare substitute one into the other both are equal to 0 substitute you will find that f sub x divided by f sub y is equal to g sub x divided by g sub y correct f sub x sorry huh, f sub x into g sub y equal to right so if this is equal at that point at x naught y naught call this equal to lambda naught it is a number okay so it will mean that fx comma fy at that point is equal to lambda naught times gx into gy is it not this equation means precisely this have we proved what we wanted we have proved we have shown that the gradient of f at the point x naught y naught is equal to a constant times the gradient of g at that point this is the idea that is why it works how does it help us though so to find the constraint maximum we look at all the points where the gradient of f 
and the gradient of g are parallel to each other. Earlier what we did to find critical points we found points at which the gradient of f is 0 is it not critical point means 0. Now we do not do that. Now we look at the points at which the gradient of f is a constant times gradient of g right at any local extremum point constraint extremum local constraint constraint means as far as this curve is concerned at any such point the gradient of f has to be parallel to the gradient of g do you get it. So, instead of finding critical points find points at which the gradient of f is parallel to the gradient of g. What does that mean? I have to look at this equation gradient of f this is the gradient of f f sub x f sub y at certain point it should be parallel to the gradient of g should be equal to lambda times g sub x g sub y at that same point is it not parallel means what this vector is a constant multiple of that other vector. So, so find points at which this happens and those points must lie also in fact on the curve where you are constraining the function. So, this has to be the case and g at that point has to be 0 because g 0 gives you the curve. This is known as Lagrange method of multipliers. This lambda is called a multiplier ok. That lambda will change from point to point. So, you introduce a new parameter new variable what are the original variables x and y? What are the two functions f and g? What are the roles of those two functions? f is the one whose maximum and minimum we are trying to find. What is g doing? g is defining a curve and I am trying to find the maximum and minimum of f on that curve. What to do? Introduce one more variable that is called lambda. Solve this equation where f x comma f y equal to lambda times g x comma g y which are the points on the curve where this equation is satisfied. To be on the curve means g x y equal to 0 right. Find those points. So, if the function f has a absolute maximum or absolute minimum on that curve it has a local maximum or local minimum on that curve then this equation must be satisfied this equation must be satisfied all right then again make the list in that list whichever is the biggest will give you constraint absolute maximum whichever is the smallest will give you constraint absolute minimum you get it the procedure is the same but now since we are no more in the boundary we can be anywhere in the anywhere in the domain we look at the curve as implicitly defined by a function g and use the parallelism gradient of f is parallel to the gradient of g all right. This is uh, called Lagrange multiplier this word Lagrange or the name Lagrange has come before now when did it come? Lagrange mean value theorem and I told you it is perhaps the most important theorem in one variable differential calculus and it has its own avatars in the two variable and so on. Lagrange is a great mathematician at those times mathematicians and physicists and engineers they were all the same there is not much difference between philosophers were also considered mathematicians and mathematicians were considered so at th th that is 17th century and so on. Have you heard of Eiffel Tower? Eiffel Tower where is it? It is here can you see it? <laughs> So, in the Eiffel Tower that box is there no it is not very nicely this box is at the first uh, not even first I think there are three uh, three etage means there has anyone is it that there there are three uh, you can go up to first level costs lot of uh, euros then second level more euros third level more euros this is the first euro. So, around this what I am why am I telling you this? Do you see this sl slots here? There are 72 or so great names, uh, not great names, names of great French mathematicians and uh, physicists and so on. They are written. Uh, unfortunately, the slide is not very clear, but I can read out. He, this is the name Laplace, then this is some Belgium something, then there is a sorry, this is the name Lagrange, and this is Laplace. Laplace also you must have heard, no? 
So, these are French mathematicians. Anyway, this is just a picture to make you wake up and so on. So, we have been doing some heavy things. This is the heavy thing, Lagrange multiplier theorem. So, I want you to remember this theorem. We are not going to prove it, but I have given you enough idea why Lagrange theorem has to be the way it is. What does it say? Look at an interior point. F and G are two functions. They have partial derivatives which are continuous in the neighborhood. G equal to 0 defines a smooth curve. Okay. Suppose at the point x0, g is 0, that means this equation is satisfied and the gradient of g is not equal to 0. Why is that condition put? If the gradient is 0, that means the vector is 0, 0, you can say it is parallel to any vector, it does not tell you anything special. So, the gradient should not be equal to 0. The function f restricted to c should have a local extremum. If you know that there is such a local extremum, then there is a lambda such that the gradient of f is parallel to the gradient of g by the factor lambda or lambda naught, whatever. You understand? We, we read it out, but I will tell you in words now. You have two functions f and g, both are defined on the domain. f is a function which plays the role of our investigation, finding out whether the f has a local extremum, local minimum, but not on the whole domain, on a curve defined by the other function g. Okay? If the gradient of g at that point is not equal to 0 and if the function f has a local minimum or local maximum at that point on the curve, constrained maximum as far as that curve is concerned, then the gradient of f has to be parallel to the gradient of g. That means the gradient of f has to be a multiple of the gradient of g. Huh. That is because we did all kinds of things you now here, I just erase, divided by, suppose it defines a function eta x, it supports to say that yes, it will define the function eta x and so on, you need this extra condition. It will imply differentiability, it is much more, much more stronger, is it not? If the partial derivatives exist and are continuous, the function is differentiable. Just differentiability, either it is not enough or the proof becomes too involved. That is why a simplifying assumption is made. Good you ask. All right. So, these are known as, this lambda is also called undetermined multiplier. Why? Because I do not know what is lambda. I am just putting an extra variable. I have to determine lambda. How to determine? So that this equation will be satisfied and this equation will be satisfied simultaneously. What does simultaneously mean? At the same point, you have to point, find the point x0, y0 such that fx at x0, y0, fy at x0, y0 is equal to some constant times gx at x0, y0, gy at x0, y0 and gx0, y0 equal to 0. So, simultaneously you have to solve. I think uh, best is to best is to look at uh, example because we have talked so much. The thing that you must keep in mind is that this gradient g should not be equal to 0, otherwise this has no meaning, right. So, if the gradient is 0, you have to consider that as a separate extra point and so on. I mean, you have to consider separate. Okay. Now, the first example is kind of it. <laughs> okay. Find the maximum or minimum of f x y equal to x times y subject to x plus y equal to 2. What does that mean? The function is defined on the whole domain x plus y equal to 2. The whole domain, whole real line, uh, whole plane is the domain. This is the curve in that it is, div it is give given by the function g x y equal to x plus y minus 2, no? Okay. So, it fits into our situation. But sometimes there is a much easier way of doing it rather than going through the Lagrange multiplier and so on. What is the easy way? Here, this equation has to be satisfied means y has to be equal to 2 minus x. Then what does f become? f x y which is equal to x times y and x times 2 minus x, right? So, we have to find x where this function has absolute maximum or absolute minimum. Why go to Lagrange multipliers? 
So just solve it as a one variable case. So this is just to tell you that before rushing to Lagrange multiplier, sometimes maybe you can make a substitution and get the result. So let us do that here. So you have put phi equal to x comma this is y, y equal to 2 minus x is x into 2 minus x. So derivative of that is 2 into 1 minus x. So derivative is look at the behavior of the derivative. Derivative of phi dash x is equal to 2 into 1 minus x, right. So the derivative is positive if x is less than 1 and negative if x is bigger than 1, right. So positive before, negative afterwards. Positive if before means increasing function, negative afterwards means decreasing function. So at that point, it must be the maximum, right. So we are done. So phi 1 equal to 1 is the absolute maximum. Phi, phi 1 equal to 1 means x is equal to 1 and y is equal to 2 minus, uh, 2 minus 1, that is 1. So at 1, 1 comma 1. So this is a fun, this is a problem in two variables, but we can very easily reduce it to one variable, so no problem. But let us look at a point where we shall use our theory of Lagrange multipliers and so on. So have a look at it, I will explain to you now. So you have two conditions, uh, is it two or one? Oh yeah, at the moment one. We shall go to two conditions later. The function g given, which tells you the constraint g is the constraint function, right? And g is x squared plus y squared minus 1. What does that mean? It's, it should lie on the circle, right? And the function fxy equal to xy. We already did it, but now we are doing the same problem with Lagrange multiplier so that your ideas will get fixed. How to do? In, look at this function g. That is the constraint function. Gradient of f should be a constant times lambda times uh, constant times the gradient of g and g must be equal to 0. So that gives you three equations. Why three equations? Because this is a vector equation. Vector equation means what? First component here must be the first component here. Second component here must be the second component here. So although it looks like one equation, there are two equations huh? as well as real numbers are concerned. And this is one equation. So this is the first equation y equal to 2 times lambda x. Is it correct? What is the partial of f with respect to x? Partial of f with respect is y equal to lambda partial of g with respect to x. What is the partial of 2x? So y equal to 2 lambda x is the first equation. Similarly, x equal to 2 lambda y is the second equation. And this is the constraint equation x square plus y square minus 1 equal to 0. What are you supposed to do? Solve these three equations simultaneously. Means find points x and y. No matter how, do something or the other, eliminate something, do whatever you can, easiest, for, easiest way and find points. What will I do? I will multiply these two, y and x. What do I get? y x equal to 4 lambda square into x y, correct? Can I cancel y x from both sides? Yes, because, no, look, x square plus y square minus 1 equal to 0, correct? x square plus y square. So if x is equal to 0, because of this y will be equal to 0, is it not? If y equal to 0, because of this equation x will be equal to 0. So if either x or y is 0, both will be 0. If both are 0, they cannot satisfy this equation, understand? Therefore I can cancel x, y from both sides and I get 4 lambda square equal to 1. So far lambda was an undetermined multiplier, now it gets determined. 4 lambda square equal to 1 means lambda must be uh, 1 upon root 2 plus and minus 1 upon root. So these are the two values of lambda we got. The moment you get lambda, you will be able to, you, you will be able to uh, the moment you get lambda, put lambda here 1 upon root 2, then you get an equation in x and y and put here equation in x, y, you will find that x must be, if x is 1 upon root 2, then y must be also 1 upon root 2. If x is equal to minus 1 upon root 2, y must be also minus 1 upon root 2, okay. So you have found out 4 points now, hmm? 2 values of lambda plus and, uh, plus and minus half and 4 values of the point x comma y. Well, look at the values of the function 
at these points. We have to make sure some of the hypotheses of the Lagrange theorem. What are the hypotheses? The gradient should not be 0. Is it equal to 0? What is the gradient of the function 2x comma 2y? Is it not 2x comma 2y? Huh? So, if it is 0 means x equal to y equal to 0, but then it cannot satisfy gxy equal to 0. Just now we saw if x is 0, y equal to 0, then x square plus y square cannot be equal to 1, right. So, therefore, we have satisfied the condition that the gradient of g is not equal to 0. Then this set x y in R2 g x y equal to 0 is a unit circle. It is non-empty, closed and bounded and g is a continuous function. So, it has to have maximum, it has to have minimum. So, we are using everything that we talked today. In the beginning, I said extreme value theorem. What is extreme value theorem? If you have a non-empty, closed and bounded set and a continuous function on it, it has to have absolute maximum, it has to have absolute minimum. So, that is used and then by Lagrange multiplication, find out the various values, you will find plus half and minus half are the. So, the rest of it is easy, okay. So, this is known as Lagrange method for one constraint. Now, sometimes you have two constraints huh? and sometimes you have instead of two, three variables. So, in the last uh, 10 minutes or so, I am going to tell you how to treat the three variable case with one constraint and two constraints. All right. So, let us look at three variable case with one constraint. Is it any different? Not at all. Instead of two variables, there are three. f will be a function of x, y, z. y will be a function of x, y, z. Do the same that we did for two variables. But for that, we have to develop the theory of three, vari three variables. But we have been already talking about gradient of a function of three variables, is it not? And so on. So, there is nothing much. But just to re remind you, to talk about functions and sequences in R3, you, you should know what a sequence here looks like. It looks like x n, y n, z n. Then a function is continuous at a point x naught, y naught, z naught. Whenever x n, y n, z n converges to x naught, y naught, z naught, x n should be y n here, z n should convert to f at x naught, y naught, z naught. Continuity, same. We have already considered partial derivatives. We have already considered gradient. Differentiability also, we can do the same way. Carathodor lemma or whatever increment lemma and so on. We will not spend time on that. All right. We used in our discussion orthogonal gradient theorem. What was it? If a function of two variables, right? Right? You have a function of two variables and if it achieves its maximum or minimum, local maximum or minimum at a point, then the gradient of the function is perpendicular to the tangent vector. That is what we saw. That is for two variables. The same result will hold for three variables. You have a curve of xz, yz, xz, xt, yt, zt. Is it not like a helix for example? It is a three dimensional curve. So, it is exactly the same. The gradient of f at a local minimum point is perpendicular to the tangent vector. So, we have seen that. Now, this is Lagrange multiplier method for functions of three variables. What is new? Nothing new. You have functions of three, three variable. Function uh, f from a domain in uh, D in R3. This is a domain in R3 now. Find out points where the gradient of f is parallel to the gradient of g. And g should be 0. Make sure that the gradient of g is not equal to 0 and you get the solutions. So, now how many equations will be there? One vector equation, that means three equations and then g x y z equal to 0, four equations. You solve them and uh, you will get. In case instead of two, two conditions, uh, one condition, if you have two conditions, g equal to 0, h equal to 0. I will get, tell you a picture and then we shall see the result. So, now we have a domain D in R3, okay. So, the domain is like this. It is a solid domain, huh? it is not thin, solid domain, like a full ball or a, a cube with inside included and so on. So, this is a function f, 
you want to find out its maximum minimum. There are two constraints. What are the constraints? G x y z equal to 0 and h x y z equal to 0. What will this do? Will it define a curve in R3? No. G x y z equal to 0 defines a curve in R2. But G x y z equal to 0 will define a what will it define? Will it define a curve? For example, for example, suppose I have x square plus y square plus z square minus 1 equal to 0. What does it define? It defines a surface. The analog of a curve in two dimension is a surface in three dimension. So this will define a surface, this will define a surface. Now both the constraints have to be satisfied. That means here is a surface, here is another surface, both have to be satisfied. So when you intersect two surfaces, here is a surface and here is a surface intersecting it. What will you get? A curve. Two surfaces intersect in a curve, right? So if you want to look at the picture, suppose this is a surface and here is another surface. I will use another chalk. So this will, they will intersect in a curve and then we are in, interested in knowing the absolute maximum and absolute minimum. So in this case, instead of, instead of gradient of f being equal to lambda times gradient of g, instead of this, which is the case in one variable, to solve the equations gradient of f equal to lambda times gradient of g plus mu times the gradient of h. So instead of this, you add instead of lambda having an undetermined multiplier, you have two undetermined multipliers. Gradient of f is equal to lambda gradient of g plus gradient of c. And then of course you have two equations, g equal to 0, h equal to 0. So the Lagrange multiplier method for two constraints says find out lambda and mu and points x, y, z at which this equation is satisfied and also at these two are satisfied and then you find out the and make sure the function has to have a maximum or minimum there. So there is a reason why this comes. This comes, I will tell you in short, you can read it at leisure later on. If you have a vector fix and three vectors perpendicular to it. So the, to the tangent vector to the intersection, this is going to be perpendicular. Lambda g is going to be perpendicular because g x y z equal to 0 and this is going to give you another vector which is per per perpendicular. So for a tangent vector, this is perpendicular, this is perpendicular, this is perpendicular. If you have a vector and what are all the vectors perpendicular to it? They are, they are lie in a plane, right? So if there are three of them, what will happen? One of them has to be a linear combination of the other two. Is it not? There cannot be three vectors not having any relation with each other being perpendicular to the same tangent vector. That is the reason. So this is perpendicular, this is perpendicular, this is perpendicular. Then this must be a combination of the two which are perpendicular. So that is the reason but uh, th this you can justify by looking at the orthogonal gradient theorem but at the moment I will skip it and come to the examples so that to have your idea. So find out the maximum and minimum value of x plus 2y plus 3z on the curve of intersection of the planes, a, a plane and a cylinder. Imagine now. The first constraint x minus y plus z, that means it should lie on the plane. Second constraint, it should lie on the cylinder, x square plus y square equal to 1. So here is a cylinder, you are cutting it by a plane. What will you get in general? A cylinder is cut by a plane, what will you get? No, no, no. Cylinder means it's a hollow cylinder, just the surface of the cylinder. It is cut by a plane, what will you get? Circle if it is going horizontally like this, but if I go by oblique plane, 
it will be an ellipse. So, in, in any case that is a curve and we want to find out the maximum minimum of the function on that curve. So, first of all make sure that the function is continuous, it is continuous. This set x plus y plus z, x minus y plus z equal to 1 and x square plus y square, oh this extra 1 is not needed, equal to 1, it is a closed and bounded set. Therefore, the maximum and minimum has to be taken. You can check it is uh, non-empty. For example, if you put x equal to 1, y equal to 0, z equal to 0, it is satisfied. x equal to 1, y equal to 0, it is satisfied. So, there is something non-empty and then. Now, the rest of it is uh, simple now. What is this? 1, 2, 3 is the gradient of f. Gradient of f is 1, 2, 3. So, 1, 2, 3 should be equal to lambda times gradient of g plus mu times gradient of y. You solve it and you get it. The calculations are simple. So, this is for one equation and the remaining two or three minutes. An example where there are two conditions. Now, this you have to be careful because you have many equations to be satisfied, but many times those equations reduce to a very simple calculation and this is the case here. In next week's tutorial, I am giving examples of this kind and you will have some practice. All right. So, what are the, what is the, uh, what is the problem? Determine a point on the intersection of the two planes which is closest to the origin. First of all, if the point lies on the, if the origin lies on one of the planes, then there is nothing to it, right? So, but the origin does not lie. If you put x, y, z equal to 0, you are not getting it. So, origin is away from both the planes, correct? Now, we have to look at the point on the intersection of the two planes. So, this will give you one constraint. This will give you another constraint. But the nearest to the origin means what? There is some function we should minimize. What should we should minimize? The distance function. What is the distance function from origin? Distance of a point x, y, z from the origin is equal to square root of x square plus y square plus z square. So, the function that we need to minimize is f x y z equal to 0. Now, you can imagine when you take the gradient of this, there are going to be square roots and so on. But why to take a square root? If I minimize this at a point, then the square root also will be minimized. So, I make a simplification. Instead of minimizing the square root of x square plus y square plus z square, I just decide to minimize x square at the same point. You know? Wherever square root is minimized, the square is minimized. Wherever square positive, everything fine. So I decide to take the function f to be equal to this. We have to minimize. Then look at the set E at which both are zero. Now here is a plane cut by another plane, right? Two planes intersect each other in a straight line. That straight line is a closed set, but it's not a bounded set. Is it not a line in the space? It goes from this way to that way all the way. So, it is not bounded. So, we cannot apply our earlier extreme value theorem and say, yeah, f has to have a maximum minimum. So, you have to do a little bit of work. What you do is there. So, here is the line and you want to find out whether the function has a minimum on this line. To do that, you take a point here, some point on the line and look at the values of the function which are restricted to a ball about that point here. Now, that means between here and here. This is the closed and bounded. Although the whole line is not closed and bounded, if I have found a point here, right, then I can restrict only that segment which is inside certain ball. And then I can find the minimum. Both the minimum will be the same. So, this is the argument that I have given to make sure that there is one. The rest of it is simple. Lambda f equal, uh, del, uh, gradient of f equal to lambda times gradient of g plus mu times gradient of h you get three equations, then g equal to 0, h equal to 0, one equation, another equation. You find out lambda, lambda has this value and mu at this value and you get a point p, p naught. And then you say that the other things are satisfied. But you get only one point p naught. You should get maximum, you should get minimum, is it not? How to tell whether it is a maximum or minimum? What are you maximizing, minimizing? the distance from the origin to points here. So, the points here, they go here and here, the distance will become larger and larger. So, there is no maximum, is it not? 
but there is a minimum because of the argument that we gave here restrict to this space uh, this segment where the uh, line intersects a ball whatever is the minimum on the whole line has to be minimum on this line we cannot say whatever is the maximum on the whole line has to be the maximum on this line no because the maximum becomes bigger and bigger there understand no so lagrange method gives you a possibility but that possibility is exactly the situation you have to argue and that's how we have argued all right so we have now completed two variable three variable differential calculus from next time we are going to do multiple integration that is double integral and as i told you there are no new ideas the same ideas it these will revise your ideas for the riemann integral and also helpful for the double integral all right